outlaw schoology every single grade. And that's the story of the evolution of Wade. All right, BC students, this is one of my favorite lessons. This is going to get crazy, but we are going to prove the validity of integration using limits. Last chapter, we proved that derivatives are really just limits. All right, so this is pretty cool. A little harder than derivatives, but it's a great thing. This is one of those things I mentioned that when we get to the second semester, you won't believe the kind of stuff we can do. All right, so here's our proposition today. The integration from 1 to 3 of e to the negative x dx should be written not as an integral, but as a limit. So we're going to kind of prove how these developed, you know, the proof of integration. So, so you can write integration as a limit? Hmm, we've never done that before. That's new. Okay, let's start with this. Let's just go back to basics and try to draw a picture here and try to show ourselves what's happening. All right, so integration is an integration area under the curve. Remember, isn't e to the negative x technically e to the negative x minus zero? You remember area is top minus bottom and then you put an integral on it, right? So think of this as e to the negative x is the upper boundary, zero is the lower boundary, okay? What's zero? Zero is the x-axis, right? Y equals zero, okay? What's the top boundary? What's e to the negative x? Isn't that just classic exponential decay, right? Plug in 0 for x, e to the 0 is 1. So you can always count on that point, 0 comma 1, as we've done so many times before, right? So the curve passes through 0 comma 1. It is not growth. It's to the negative x. It is decay. So draw me a nice little exponential decay up here. All right. And then we're going to block it off from 1 to 3 according to the limits of integration. That's what we call those things, right? So block it off from 1 to 3, and integration finds the exact area, doesn't it? Okay, big production about that in the first semester, right? So there's the visual picture as to what's happening. Okay, I don't see any limits yet. You're not supposed to yet. Now let's go back to a completely different thing we did in the first semester. The right-hand Riemann sum. Remember right and left Riemann sums? We did a lot of those, right? Chapter 6, chapter 7. So. We're going to break this up into five partitions. We're going to go old school. Before they knew that integration found exact area, they did little subsections. All right? So five partitions. Look at the picture. Five rectangles. That's going to be a very rough estimation of the actual curve, but not, not a great estimation, but that's where it begins. Okay? So delta x. Remember delta x is width of each building, the width of each rectangle. Do you remember at one point in the first semester that I told you the formula for delta x is always b minus a over n? That'll be a bit important in this chapter for sure, okay? What's b minus a? That would be 3 minus 1. In other words, what's the width of the whole darkened figure here, shaded figure? 3 minus 1 or 2 across. Okay, so the shape is 2 across but we're gonna chop it into five buildings, five sections. So n is the number of sections, okay? So if you take two across and you divide it by five, then the width of each building would be only two-fifths, which totally makes sense, actually. So here's one, because that was, that's the one there. Two-fifths, 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 two-fifths. You should end at three, and we do, okay? Now, let's get a close-up of this. And if you remember doing the old Riemann sums, you may remember that it's the point of contact that matters, okay? That point over there doesn't really mean anything. It's the point where the building actually contacts the curve. And by the way, I should mention this too, you probably already know this, but this gigantic, this is the exponential decay. See, I just blew up that other picture because it's very hard for you to draw rectangles in that little area, right? So I blew it up super big for us on the paper. Okay? And if you don't have a printer, I guess you can try to write this on a sheet of paper if you can. All right? You can pause the video and do that. I didn't think about that. Yeah. If you don't have paper, that makes this one a little tricky. Okay, so we've got uh, this point right here is where the first partition or rectangle hits the curve. We're going to call it x sub 1, y sub 1. A second point of contact, x2, y2, x3, y3, etc. We have five points total. Okay? 
Uh, we kind of missed the two because we were going by this awkward two-fifths right here, which is fine. It works. Now, here's what I want you to do. This is how we discovered integration and how it works and how we can prove it. So let's start with the first coordinate, x1, y1. Okay, it's called x1, y1, but what is it really? Okay, let's go right and up. So from the origin, you would go right one plus the width of the building, which is two-fifths. So isn't this x coordinate right here one plus two-fifths? Okay, let's put that down. One plus two-fifths. And you can certainly label this x sub 1 equals if you want to kind of keep track of where we are here, okay? Now, you don't have to simplify that. Don't get a common denominator. Don't put it together. We're looking for patterns today. When you oversimplify things, you lose the pattern. When you keep them unsimplified, you see patterns, all right, very clearly. So <clears throat> x sub 2, you would go from the origin, right 1 plus 2 fifths plus 2 fifths. We can go ahead and call that 1 plus 4 fifths. That's fine. So x sub 2 is 1 plus 4 fifths. And you start to make a little gain out of this, all right? Write 1 plus 1, 2, 3 times 2 fifths. Write 1 plus 1, 2, 3, 4 times 2 fifths. Dot, dot, dot. The last point is going to be called x sub 5. And it is 1 plus 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 times two-fifths, okay? Let's put that actually over here to the side. One plus five different two-fifths, all right? If you want to, don't, don't, I know you're tempted to cross cancel, we always do, actually don't, but just for fun in your head, cancel out the fives and you get one plus two is three. Oh yeah, we're supposed to end at three. It's working, this is actually working, so you're doing it right. Okay, so over here, I'm actually gonna do this, this is kind of crazy, but I'm gonna do 5 times 2 is 10 fifths to try to keep the pattern going here. This is the only time we would ever do this. You would always cross cancel, by the way. 1 plus 10 fifths, okay? So it's 1 plus 2 fifths, 4 fifths, 6 fifths, 8 fifths, and 10 fifths. Makes a nice little pattern. Now let's go over here to the y column because what's a point? A point is a coordinate, right? Well, we've got the x coordinate. We need the y coordinate, don't we? Okay, we need y sub 1. Hmm. Let's go back over here, all right? Let's get a close-up of this. Well, y sub 1 would be the height of the rectangle. That's the whole deal with Riemann sums, right? And trapezoidal rule and all the other the ones that we did, you know, inscribed, circumscribed, all that. So the height of the rectangle is y sub 1. I don't know how tall that rectangle is, but you know what? We've got an equation, e to the negative x. If you have an equation, you just plug in the x coordinate into the equation and it will take you up the elevator to the equation. That's what we do in math, right? So use your e to the negative x. But I'm going to plug in that x coordinate, 1 plus 2 fifths, which is currently right there. Okay? Which is the same thing, by the way, as 7 fifths, but we're just not going to write it that way today. So e to the negative x is e to the negative, and you're replacing x with your given x coordinate. That's exactly how we find y coordinates in math, okay? So theoretically, the height of that rectangle is whatever irrational number decimal that would give you on a calculator. e to the negative, basically, 7 fifths is what that is. Okay, now you kind of see how to play the game. y sub 2, take your x coordinate and plug it in. Negative quantity, 1 plus 4 fifths, okay? And you can do a gigantic parentheses and a comma if you want to make it a coordinate, all right? And then finally, dot, 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 the last thing you would do, y sub 5 equals e to the negative x, but it's negative 1 plus 10 fifths, keeping the pattern going. And all these things make patterns that we've kind of hinted at throughout the year, but we've never really put it on paper. And now we're really exploring this thing. And then we take this information and we try to figure out what is the integration from 1 to 3 of this function, because that's the main study right now. Well, that's the area. Integration is exact area, but we're just estimating it right now. Isn't the approximate area under the curve area 1 plus area 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5? Just add the five rectangles together and you'll get a very rough, is it over or under now? Well, you can see the rectangles are under, so this is going to be an underestimation, right? Because they're under the curve. So, first rectangle. Isn't every rectangle's area base times height? We're just using base times height. 
to prove the validity of integration. Can you believe this? This is wacky. All right, what's the width of this building? Two-fifths, they're all two-fifths. What's the height? The y-coordinate. So the first rectangle is two-fifths by that number, okay? I erased part of it, oops. All right, so what's the second rectangle? Width two-fifths by that y-coordinate, because that was y2. What's the dimensions of this building, or what are the dimensions of this building? It's a two-fifths again by whatever the third coordinate would be. Okay, so I want to show you this. All right, won't they all have a width of two-fifths? I'm going to get a two-fifths by something, plus a two-fifths by something, plus a two-fifths by something. They all have a width of two-fifths. You can factor out the common width. We've done that before. I want you to factor the common width out to the front. That's going to be part of your pattern. And then I want you to write what's left over inside. If you factor the base or width out, aren't all the heights left over? And aren't they added because you're adding the five rectangles together? Okay? So let's make a little space right here so you can see this. All right. Height one was e to the negative one plus two fifths. Hopefully this makes sense on a middle school level since it's really not calculus yet. Not really. Okay. Second one would be two-fifths by or distributed to the second height, second rectangle height. Negative quantity one plus four-fifths, all right? Take that out. I'm going to put plus dot, 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 and then put a plus the last one, okay? And the very last one was simply E, it's right there, to the negative one plus 10 over 5 quantity, close your parentheses, I'll erase that so it doesn't get all jumbled up on your screen, and that, whatever decimal that is, that would estimate the area under this curve before they knew that integration did the exact area. Interesting, okay? Of course you know I'm curious as a cat, right? So I put it in a calculator. I was just curious what would happen. When I put all this in, it took a while, by the way, for me to enter it. It's kind of cumbersome. But when I put all this into the calculator right here, I got, I'll put it, uh, you can fit it on your paper down here, but I'll just put it up here. I got roughly 0 0.2587 about. A very, that's a very tiny amount of area. But exponential decay is so low down to the x-axis because there's an asymptote, right? So it's so low, it doesn't give you much area. Then I, you know what I did? I integrated this, which is a very simple integration, by the way, and I got the exact area. Turns out that what we have so far is approximately 81%. Oh, we said it was an underestimation, didn't we? Less than 100%. It's an underestimation. 81% of what it should have been. Okay, that's not good enough to manufacture cars, airplanes, not even Frisbees. I mean, you can't make stuff that's like only 81% of the proper area when you're manufacturing things, all right? So to engineers, that would be a disaster. Not bad for five rectangles. That's not too bad, but 81%, that ain't going to cut it. How do we do better? Let's try six rectangles, all right? Let's go to the other board and do the same thing with six rectangles. All right, six partitions. Always find your delta x first. So now, when we do our b minus a over n, b minus a is still 3 minus 1, same picture as before, right? 3 minus 1 goes on top, which is going to be 2 still, but we're going to break it up into 6 partitions. So n is now 6. So if you were to break up a width of 2 into 6 little buildings, wouldn't that reduce to one-third? So it'd be like one-third, 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 one-third. That's all your bases of the rectangles, right? Okay, that's an important step first. Okay, now let's go to the points like we did before. I'm going to start showing you these patterns so you're really going to understand how this is done. I don't like it in college when they just throw the formula at you and you're like, what does the formula even mean? Like, how does it work? See, all of you are so curious. You always ask me, like, how does that work? Why does that formula work? I'm showing you right now, okay? So this is good, because they won't take the time in college to show you this. So, first point, x1, y1, at the top of that rectangle right there, where we're still doing a right-hand Riemann sum, okay? So the first point is going to be x sub 1 equals 
Where is this x coordinate right here? Start from the origin. Go right one plus one third, not two fifths this time. It was two fifths last time. It's now one third. But I want to take a step back. I know we always reduce our fractions. I want to take a step back, and actually, I would rather do two over six. I wanted to show you that it was one third, but I want to stick with the pattern two over five, two over six, two over seven for seven partitions, two over eight for eight partitions. So let's do this. One plus two sixths is going to be better. Okay? All right. X sub two, that top little corner right there, is located right above what on the x axis? Origin, one plus two sixths plus two sixths, right? Two sets of two sixths. So you get one plus two sixths plus another two sixths makes four sixths. Okay? And then you get one plus six over six, one plus eight over six, one plus 10 over six, and the pattern continues. When you get to the last point, that's gonna be called X sub six. Six partitions, we need six corners of the building, six different corners touching. X sub six equals, now let's do a little work over here first. One plus one, two, three, four, five, six partitions, so, one plus six times two over six, okay? One plus six jumps each one worth two sixths, if that makes sense. And the sixes cancel in your mind, but don't actually do it, but in your mind they cancel, and you get one plus two is three. It ends at three, this is working, okay? But actually, we're gonna do this to stick with the pattern. We're gonna say six times two is 12, we're gonna call this one plus 12 over six. Because we, didn't we just say that? Six over six, eight over six, 10 over six, 12 over six, pattern. Okay, get all that out of the way first. Now let's go over here to comma y1. What's y1? What is the y coordinate on top of this building right here? Oh, it's sitting on the curve. It's a point on the curve. Oh, I could just take the x coordinate beneath it which is this, plug it into e to the negative x again and produce automatically a y coordinate without even typing it in the calculator and getting a decimal, no need for that. It's e to the negative x, but it's e to the negative one plus two over six, okay? Second roof of the building. y sub two equals e to the negative x, one plus four over six. It's telling you all the diminishing heights. They get lower and lower and lower, but never quite zero, right? Okay, dot, dot, dot. And then finally, we get y sub six is e to the negative one plus 12 over six. This column requires very little thought. You're really just doing the substitution property from middle school, but like just you know shoving numbers in, okay? All right, let's give this another shot. And then we're just about ready now. I think your minds are just about ready to really digest how they proved integration using limits. We're almost there. All right, what's the area under the curve? Well, integration is exact. We approximated it with six right-hand sum rectangles, the Riemann sum, because Georg Riemann was the one who came up with this idea, right? That's why we call it the Riemann sum. Base times height, plus base times height, plus base times height, plus base times height, six times in a row. You're gonna give me six rectangles but all of the bases are called delta x, which is two over six. Those are all your widths. Couldn't you just factor out the common width? Two over six, right? Base times first height, e to the negative one plus two over six in parentheses, plus the next rectangle. Base times height, the next height, the y coordinate is always the height. Negative one plus four over six, plus dot, 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 plus the last little tiny rectangle, base two over six, times or distributed to that height. And you see a lovely little pattern here, if you look at this, because later on, by the way, we will be looking at the pattern and going backwards 
to try to find the curve, we'll do that too. Can everybody see e to the negative x as the original function in there? Because you're going to look for that later. And then can everybody see it's just a nice pattern? 1 plus every even number over 6, basically, until you get to 12 over 6. Okay? And then there's your delta x right out front. All right. You can leave the answer just like that. And when I put all this into a calculator right here, I got roughly 0 0.2680 zero to four places just about okay isn't that still an underestimation we're still missing a lot of stuff up there right a lot of gaps in there it's an underestimation then of course i integrated the function for real which is a very easy function that all of you can integrate i put that into a calculator because it's got ease in it and then i got the fact that the real area well that's about 84 percent of it right there so we got about 84% of the real area. Not good enough for engineers trying to manufacture shapes or architects trying to get all this stuff right. But you know what? Not bad for six rectangles. It's better. Got better than 81% for sure. So now we're 84% of the way there. All right. Let's do this thing for real. And we'll start with a fresh board over here to do this. So just imagine that number 12 ranked Riemann actually died at the age of 40 and still had enough discoveries to get into the top 12 all time. That is staggering because most of those top mathematicians, they kind of need like a whole lifetime of living into their 60s, 70s, 80s to really pioneer a lot of mathematics. He was just so advanced and so genius. So here's Riemann's idea. Let's follow the footsteps of the great Georg Riemann. He said, all right, he was thinking five rectangles. Okay, decent approximation. Remember, they still did not realize that integration was the area under the curve yet. As of this moment, they didn't understand that integration was going to find area. This is a huge discovery in math history, right? So Riemann says five rectangles, not good enough. Six rectangles, a little bit better, 84%, not good enough. Seven rectangles, a little better. Eight rectangles, a little better, but it's still not going to be exact ever. How do we get the exact answer, doggone it? So Riemann, for his PhD, by the way, you can't get a math PhD without finding a new discovery that's brand new to math. This is how he got his PhD. I think the best math PhD ever, all right? He's this young college student. He's like 25, a graduate student when he got his PhD, doing this, changing world history and the Industrial Revolution for manufacturing, okay? So Riemann says, hmm, instead of five rectangles, six rectangles, seven rectangles, let's define it as n number of rectangles, all right? We'll say that n is just going to be some generic formula to kind of cover all. So we're doing a generalized version now instead of a specific version. Okay, same curve. You still have your 1 to 3. Oh, I didn't put the 3 in there. Still have your 1 to 3, all right? You've got x sub 1, y sub 1. You've got x2, y2, dot, dot, dot. The second to last point is going to be x sub n minus 1, y sub n minus 1. And the very last point is going to be x sub n, y sub n. So now in the first example we did today, n was 5, then the second example, n was 6, and now n can be anything. So this is going to be the general formula. What is the pattern that we were developing on those two boards before? What pattern were we actually writing out? Well, we found our delta x first, b minus a over n, 3 minus 1 over how many rectangles? n rectangles this time, not 5, not 6, n rectangles. So you'll leave it in this time. And 2 over n is going to be your delta x, okay? And didn't we say it was like 2 over 5, 2 over 6, 2 over 7? So that makes sense. That, that's the general formula. Now the first point where the rectangle touches the curve, what is the height of the rectangle? What is the width of the rectangle? All that stuff. Well, the x-coordinate of that point, x sub 1, would be origin, right 1, plus an extra 2 over n is where that is, using this. That's why you find your delta x first, okay? x sub 1, I'll put that up there. x sub 1 is 1 plus 2 over n. Then we get our x sub 2 next, all right? That would be origin, 1 plus 2 over n plus 2 over n. That's 1 plus 4 over n. We're building the same pattern, by the way. You can see this. Then you get 1 plus 6 over n, 1 plus 8 over n, 1 plus 10 over n. And we don't know what n is, so you just keep going, keep going, keep going. Okay, last point. 
We'll do our calculation over here first like we did before. The last point is going to be 1 plus how many 2 over n's? Hmm. How many rectangles are there? How many buildings are there? N buildings. So we're going to make how many jumps of 2 over n? N jumps. Like every building is a jump, right? So it's going to be 1 plus n jumps of 2 over n to get to the very end. 1 plus n numbers of 2 over n delta x's, okay? Width of the building. And then in your head, not, not on paper, but in your head, cross cancel the n's. 1 plus 2 is 3. Yes, the ending point is 3. Great, fantastic. Last point. x sub n, this x coordinate right here, well, we know it's 3. We do know the last x sub n is 3 because that's the ending point, but we want to write it as a pattern, not as 3, right? 1 plus n times 2 is 2n over n. Okay? That's your ending point. Now we have a generic formula to cover all possible numbers of rectangles because then Riemann's going to take it to the next level. All right? So let's go back here. And of course, this column is pretty easy if you remember. y sub 1, the height of the first rectangle, would simply entail plugging the x coordinate below it into e to the negative x. So it's going to be e to the negative x becomes this 1 plus 2 over n. Okay? Second coordinate is going to be e to the negative 1 plus 4 over n. Dot, dot, dot. And then the very last coordinate is going to be y sub n equals e to the negative 1 plus 2 n over n. Boy, are we doing some abstract theoretical calculus now, right? But it gets way more abstract later in college. If you're a math major, not for engineers. Uh, but for those of us who are math majors, it gets crazy. This, this is not that bad. Okay, you know, it's just algebra, really, based on height. All right, how do you find the area under the curve e to the negative x from 1 to 3? You write out base times height, base times height, base times height, base times height. What's the base? Every building has a base of delta x, which is 2 over m. Okay, factor out the common width, remember? And then just start listing the heights. That's all you have to do, okay? There is uh, sometimes an AP problem where you have to list this, this right here. The thing we're listing, you just list it out. And so, really, you don't have to do like the five rectangle case and the six rectangle case we did earlier. You can just jump to the n rectangle case and just map it out. And you can draw a picture if you want. If you want to save time, you don't have to draw the graph. So, I just wanted to really show you today what's happening, okay? Plus dot 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 plus e to the negative 1 plus 2n over n. All right. And that is basically any number of rectangles. And I can, like, I put this into an Excel spreadsheet. And then you can just change the n and make it like 100, 1,000, 1 million. And you can just keep changing the number of rectangles and get it like really super accurate. It's kind of fun to do. All right. So let's talk about this. As n gets larger, as the number of, isn't that number of rectangles? As the number of rectangles gets larger, as you cram more and more rectangles in there, don't you get better accuracy, right? Okay, let's say the area is more accurate. The area of the rectangles is more befitting of the actual integral, which is always exact, right? So area is more accurate. All right, and now let's get a close-up and get down here to the very last part of your notes there. And this is Riemann's breakthrough right here. How do we get the exact area under a curve and prove the validity of integration? Well, this is still a finite number of rectangles, right? What's n? n could be a million, n could be a billion, but it's still finite. It'll never quite give you the exact integration. Do you remember the original question? It was a while back now. Do you remember the question said write an integral as a limit? Wait a minute, folks. Does anybody see it yet? I just took this expression and I wrote it down here for you already. It's the same expression in the box. What if the number of rectangles crammed under the curve could go to infinity? Anybody see it? It's the limit 
as the number of rectangles in approaches infinity. And if you let it go to infinity and you calculate the precise limit or the horizontal asymptote or what it's aiming for applied to just base times height from middle school, that will give you the exact area and integration. The genius idea of Remod to get his PhD. All right, amazing. And now just as a little side note, just for fun, I wanted to show you this. They could give you this on the AP test. This is not much different. It, this is the same, that's the same. You notice the first term is not the same as our first term over here. Okay, let's just dissect this for a little bit just in case you ever see this, which you will in college. E to the negative first, isn't that y sub one? Don't you always start with y sub one right there, right? y sub one, okay? The first thing in the parentheses is y sub one. So what they're saying is y sub one is e to the negative first. All right, what the heck is happening here? Uh, let's kind of go backwards then. Let's find the x sub one that links to that, okay? What was the equation? Wasn't the equation e to the negative x? What's sitting in place of x? Oh, one. Oh, you're saying that x sub one is one and y sub one is what I got when I plugged it in. Wait a minute, hold on a second. Where is the coordinate one comma e to the negative first up here? There's one on the x-axis. And then you go up until you hit the curve. That's one comma e to the negative first, okay? Wait a minute, that wasn't one of our corners of the building. Oh, hold on a second. If I did draw a rectangle up to there, it wouldn't be a right-hand sum, it would be a left-hand sum. Yes, the left-hand sum also works. If any of you clever kids out there were thinking, why are we only doing the right-hand sum? Does the left-hand sum work? Yes, it does. Now, the left-hand sum is an overestimation, but then eventually, guess what happens with the overestimation? When you go to infinite number of rectangles, it converges to the same exact area, whether it's a right-hand sum or a left-hand sum, it doesn't matter. So all this was, was a left-hand Riemann sum. And Riemann proved that both of them work the same way. Okay? Interesting stuff. And this is precisely what Riemann presented to a board of mathematicians, all of whom had their PhDs, because that's how you get a PhD. You have to be given one by people who already have a PhD and think you're worthy, all right? And who was the head of the committee that gave number 12 Riemann his PhD for this genius idea? Number two ranked Gauss. Whoa, what a duo. Professor is number two, and then the student is number 12 all time? Are you kidding me? What a combination that is, right? And Gauss was the one who recognized Riemann was a genius when he was still younger and said, wait a minute, you're planning on going into theology? Riemann was gonna be a minister. He was gonna be a church pastor. And then Gauss was like, you're a genius. I need to put you into mathematics. And so he kind of took him under his wing and then eventually gave him his PhD with this idea that just blew everybody's mind. Imagine if he had become a pastor and not become a mathematician. I wonder how long it would have taken the world to realize that integration is exact area and which changed the industrial revolution and the way that we manufacture everything now. Can you imagine if Riemann had not taken the mathematician's path? Man, I tell you, the things that happened in mathematics that where we were just so close to maybe losing somebody, you know. So a couple of side notes in the box, by the way. All right, let's talk about two over n. What was two over n again? Two over n was your building width called delta x, all right? So that's known as delta x. Okay, let's take a look at this one here. I want to show you something. Where did that two come from anyway? Wasn't that b minus a three minus one? What was three minus one? Weren't those the limits of integration on the original integral, right? So I want you to notice something. When you see delta x today and in the future, I want you to know that the top number gives you a hint about the gap between the two. Just seeing that number right there, you knew the integral had to be zero to two, or maybe one to three, or maybe two to four, or maybe 100 to 102, but you can kind of narrow down the gap at least, and then you're gonna figure out which one it is, and it ended up being one to three. I'll show you how to do that, okay? All right, and then really cool to see this right here. As n approaches infinity, is an n number of rectangles? So as n goes to infinity, number of rectangles is going to infinity. We're cramming more rectangles in that space to make it more accurate. And then Riemann just said, well, if you can get to infinity, theoretically, you get the exact answer. Whoa. All right, 
But wait, one more thing though, one more thing. As n goes to infinity, look at your delta x. Isn't that the width of each building? 2 over n, as you go to infinity, starts to become 2 over gigantic, or 2 over infinity. Wasn't that the whole thing we talked about last chapter in chapter 8, conceptual limits? 2 out of infinity on a test is a 0. Oh, look at this. Now, can you ever get to infinity? No, but we're approaching infinity. So the 2 over n width of each building is shrinking down to never 0, but infinitesimally small. You see that? So we're blowing up the number of rectangles and simultaneously shrinking down the rectangle's width to, let's say, even like approaching 0. It's getting super close to 0. And you crush those into little lines, and you basically get the exact area. Amazing.